Okay. Well, all right, we're officially live. Welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome, Chris. Uh, thank you so much. To, uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, so, j just for a little bit of reference, uh, Chris is a, is a developer at Pivotal, Pivotal Labs, which is a, uh, a global consultancy that focuses on just about everything. But they certainly do a lot of Rails and a lot of test-driven development, and a lot of pair programming. Those are all those are all things that we love here. Um, yep. So this is uh this is this is our, our group at Viking. I know so like I said, some will be listening in um, afterwards, some will be listening in during the broadcast. And uh, just a little bit of background about us. I don't know if, if you got a chance to talk to, to Dan about it, but you know, we're uh, we're roughly a four month program that that takes people from uh, essentially almost brand new to coding, uh, talented beginners to to job ready and we spend a lot of time working with them over a, it's roughly I think about twelve hundred hours at this point. Yeah. Uh, get it, getting them up the, the learning curve on Rails and, uh, and, and JavaScript. So awesome. that's where we are. So I'd, I'd love to I'd love to hear a little bit about about yourself and, and uh, you know what, what you came here to, to talk to us about. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I don't know if you want me to start with that. It actually has a section where I talk a little bit about myself and about the talk that I'm going to give. Perfect. Sure. Uh, I think screen share. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, Not quite yet. It's it's coming. It's dark, but I don't I don't see anything quite yet. Uh, oh, there it is. So yeah, if yeah. I go into full screen mode, can you no longer see it? Like I just did. I do yeah. not see it now. Ah uh, man. <laughs> Uh, let me just try sharing my entire screen and then going into regular full screen mode. Sure. Okay. What about now? That's great. Full screen mode? Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, hi, everyone on the line. Uh, this is actually my first talk that I'm giving ever, and I'm pretty nervous about it, so uh, don't judge me too hard. But, um, <laughs> I'm going to be giving a talk on what makes a good object. Uh, like was said before, my name is Chris Hendricks. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Cornell University with a degree not in computer science, but a degree in material science engineering. Um, I just happened to be sort of a hobby coder for a while um, and then decided to get serious uh, after I graduated and needed a job. Um, I started out working at a company called Workday in California, which makes HR and business software, um, and then left there to come work at Pivotal Labs, which is a software consultancy, uh, which means that if people have uh, needs, uh, software needs, um, and they don't necessarily know how to build it, or they want to learn how to build software better, they come to us and we teach them, and also build software with them. Um, so this talk today, like I said, it's called uh, What Makes a Good Object. I'm going to try and teach you by the end of this talk how to make objects and methods that are better than everyone else's objects and methods. Um, and the reason why some objects are better than others are they're sane. Um, they interact with other objects extremely confidently, and they respond to other objects consistently. So hopefully you will understand what each of those means better by the end of this talk. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be using a metaphor of a family to talk about, uh, to guide this talk. Um, and really all it means is that there's a bunch of different kinds of people and each person has very distinct ways of thinking. And you can learn or you can remember uh, better by remembering the guiding principles of each of these five family members. So we're going to talk about five different family member guiding principles. I'm going to give you a quote to help you remember it. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit of theory. Uh, we're going to go and talk uh, actually about code examples that I've written for you. We're going to give a little bit of summary of what you should have learned from that family member. By the end of it, there's going to be a section on extra reading that you can read, um, and then there's going to be a Q&A. First, oh, and uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me because I can't actually see the Hangout. So uh, if anyone's actually saying something, um, I'll need to be told that. <laughs> Okay. Um, so first up is thinking like a teenager. Um, teenagers are really, really concerned with the idea of identity, right? Who am I? What am I? Um, in particular, thinking that I will never grow up. Um, so how can this idea of identity be extended into software terms? 
Well, we model the real world um, with objects when we're doing object-oriented programming, right? And we have this unique concern about what does it mean for an object to be the same or different from any other object. Um, so one really, really broad categorical distinction uh, when talking about objects in software is this idea of value objects versus entity objects. Um, a really good example of a value object is something like a color. The color red, or, you know, RGB 25500 is the same color red is the same color red regardless of whether you're writing software that's for a game or software for HR. Um, if you contrast this instead with a person, right, um, two people who have the same name, have the same birthday, were born at the same location, um, despite having all attributes that are the same as one another are not the same person. You know, they can stand next to each other in a room and they don't take up the same space. Um, in software, though, we model entities and values with objects. So we can think in terms of can a person actually be a value type, right? So um, a value type means that um, its identity is only defined by what its fundamental attributes are. So the color red, like I said. Whereas an entity, two distinct entities, despite sharing the same attributes, are different objects. Um, but can a person be a value type in software? And the answer is obviously yes. Um, if they behave in the exact same way and they have all the same attributes, is there really any way for your software to tell the difference between them? And you can think it's teleportation merger. Um, we can start off by looking at a really good value type, a date range. So a date range as you can see here, has a start date, an end date, and a duration. And you can see in this object, I've created an initializer, um, and this initializer takes a start date, an optional end date, and an optional duration. If you don't provide either the end date or the duration, it fails on you. But if you provide one of them, it calculates the other one for you and sets both of these attributes. Um, uh, is this a good object, though? I would say no. And the reason I would say no is because if you look at this diagram right here, um, as long as you have two of these properties, you can calculate or compute the third one. So if you have the start and the end date, you can calculate the duration. If you have the start date and the duration, you can calculate the end date. So why does my initializer take all three if only two of them are the most fundamental attributes to define a date range? So I call this third attribute a computed property. Um, Instead, the better way to model this is to create what I call a designated initializer, which is always our def initialize when we're talking about a Ruby object. In this case, it takes a start date and a duration and sets those properties. Um, and then I've also made a custom initializer to capture the case of when I want to create a new date range that start only has a start date and an end date and the duration is calculated. And in this case, my custom initializer first calculates the duration from the two things that were given to the custom initializer, and then calls my designated initializer with those computed properties. Why is that better, though? We'll talk about that. So um, you might be wondering, though, what about this idea of a freeform object? What exactly do I mean about that? So here is another new class, a cell class, um, which is based on the Minesweeper uh, project that you guys have been working on. Um, and you can see that I'm creating two different kinds of cells. I'm creating a bomb cell and I'm creating a flag cell. And the way that I'm doing that is I'm calling its initializer with a symbol, bomb or flag, to denote whether or not that cell is a bomb or a flag. Um, so this contents that I'm passing in is super, super free form, um, not structured in any way. Is there any way um, that you can see that it's sort of a form of subtyping? Uh, we're sort of creating a bomb cell and a flag cell, but we're doing it in a very strange way. Um, if only we could hide that subtyping. And the way that we can do that is to instead depend on custom initializers, like in this case, cell.newMine or cell.newFlag. Each one of these custom initializers calls the designated initializer with the contents that it itself knows corresponds to a mine cell or a flag cell. That way, in the outside world, I don't ever have to concern myself with how to create a new cell of a particular type. I let the object know how to do that with its custom initializers. 
So some of the things we can learn from thinking like a teenager, separate your fundamental attributes from your computed properties. Um, think of a designated initializer. Use custom initializers which delegate down to your designated initializer and hide any subtyping that you're doing um, with custom initializers. Next up is thinking like a child. So I'm sure you've all heard, but you promise. Um, what does this mean actually in software? Well, let's go back to thinking a little bit more in the abstract sense. So I'm sure a lot of you might know that uh, software is like really, really deeply rooted in math. Um, you don't have to necessarily know math, but there's a lot of stuff that we've learned uh, to apply to software from math. So in this case, we are taking a function, f of x equals x squared, right? So all it's doing is squaring numbers. Um, you can think of this function as sort of a little factory, which transforms these blue objects, x, into red objects, the square of x. Um, like I said, you can think of it as a transformation. I really, really like f of x in this case. I really like this function. I think it's a really good function. Um, and why do I think it's a good function? Well, um, we've sort of made a definition here that a function is a transformation, but there's a more rigorous mathematics definition that might help illuminate. Um, a function is instead a relation between a set of inputs and a set of permissible outputs with the property that each input is related to exactly one output. So in this case, we've got a set of integers, right? All of my integers from negative infinity to positive infinity can be squared. And I've got a set of outputs, my set of positive integers from zero to positive infinity and I have a relation which states that every single input, oops, sorry, every single input has an output. In this case, one maps to one, two maps to four, three maps to nine, et cetera, et cetera. So what we can generalize from this, and the reason why I like this function, is a good function has consistent input types. So in this case, all of its inputs are integers, the set of positive integers, and it has consistent output types. In this case, it's only integers from zero to positive infinity, and it's got a well-defined relation from each input to output. That's a bit of math, but what does it actually mean in software terms? So here I've got a soda machine object, or a soda machine class, and I've got a dispense method, and it takes the code, and it takes the change that's been inserted. Now, if you want to take a second to read over this code, you'll see it's a little bit convoluted. It's actually got four different output types or return types. If the soda type that you gave it or that it found is nil, it returns back nil. If the number of sodas that you can purchase with the change that you inserted is zero, it returns false. If you can buy one soda, it returns you back that soda. Or if you can buy multiple sodas, it actually returns you back an array of all of the sodas that you have bought. Now, what's really strange about this? Well, we have four different return types. We have nil, false, a single object, or an array. This means that you can't depend on the output of this dispense method. How do I know when I'm using this dispense method somewhere else in my code that something is going to return nil, false, a single object, or an array of objects? That's not confident. Instead, this is what I would write. So this code take or this method takes a code and it takes a currency and it returns back an array of sodas. Um, in this case, if the soda type that it tried to find doesn't exist, it just returns you no sodas. Um, otherwise, it returns you an array, either an empty array or a filled array, with the number of sodas that you can actually purchase. One thing that we can generalize from this is think of your function's type signatures. In this case, try typing what I did up here before. So you always know that it takes a certain set of inputs that are always that kind of input and always returns back a very strict contract of what you're going to return, in this case, a list of sodas. Have consistent outputs, and you can even look at this as using arrays to encode potential failure. I was able to use an empty array to encode whether or not I could purchase zero sodas or whether the soda that I tried to find exists or not. Third up is thinking like an adult. 
No. <laughs> so we just talked about what makes a good method, right? Consistent inputs and consistent outputs. But not everyone else makes good functions like we're making. Um, so dependencies, function dependencies, are sources of uncertainty. And what that means is that any time that you rely on someone else's code, or even your own code, um, that's a point of potential point of failure. Um, in the case that we saw before with the soda machines, uh, if you were depending on that dispense code, you would be sorely disappointed if you ever tried to use, uh, for instance, an iterator like eat or math on the return. So here's another potential source of failure, right? If someone inserts zero uh, dollars or negative dollars, which is possible in the world of software, even if it isn't possible in the world, in the real world, um, what should this code do? Um, what I think you should be doing is rejecting that unworkable value and rejecting it early. So here you can see that I've actually made uh, a fail with an argument error must input positive money unless the change inserted is greater than or equal to zero. So if someone tries to input uh, negative values, um, we reject early and don't even have to worry about uh, dealing with the possibility that someone gave us negative values later else in, later in my method. Here's another potential source of failure. So if when I go to the soda type, I try and find its cost and it gives me back zero, and then I try and divide by zero, I'm going to get not a number in Ruby. Um, so one thing that we could do is extract this out, try and grab the cost from the soda, and then fail if the cost of the soda is less than a penny, you know, is greater than or equal to zero, or is greater than zero. This would help us prevent getting that not a number error, but I want everyone to question, does this actually help? It helps in a certain sense, but could this soda type dot cost uh, zero not a number thing be an issue in the rest of my code? The answer is most likely yes. If I own the soda type class, though, I have another way of preventing that potential error from propagating through my code. In this case, I do own the soda type class, and I own its initializer, too. So what I can do is when I set my cost on myself, I can use that as a potential point of rejecting unworkable values. In this case, rejecting values that aren't numbers, rejecting values that aren't greater than zero. In this way, I don't have to worry about checking for uh, that soda type that cost anytime I use the soda type because I own this and I know confidently that I wrote code that prevents me from ever dealing with that situation. So in this case, we're rejecting values at entry points into the system as opposed to usage points within the system. Um, but you don't have to only do that with objects that you own. Sometimes we have things like other numbers or code that you use from other people's libraries um, or even code that your coworkers wrote and they're not as good as you. But you can wrap external objects or objects that you don't own in objects that you do own that allow you to do that same kind of analysis. So in this case, I want to make a percent class, right? A class that encodes what it means to be a percent. And percents have to be between zero and one or inclusive. So I can actually make my own class called percent, or when I try and set the value of it, I fail early if they don't give me something that's valid. This allows you to be confident in the code that you write within your system um, and not have to worry about other people's code. So the, in summary, say no to bad dependencies and do it as early as possible. Um, Usually that means uh, when you're actually setting values or setting attributes and not when you're using them later. And another thing that you can do is wrap external objects in your own constant values. Next up, thinking like a senior. Senior, who are you? So what does that mean in software? Well, um, back to our Mindfleet, for example, we're looking back at the cell class. And here in our code, we are asking for what the contents of the flat or what the contents of that cell are. And you can see in everything that I've highlighted in red, this is all about accessing data that's inside of that cell, right? I'm asking or I'm grabbing what those contents are. I'm either setting it here or I'm getting it here and checking to see whether or not it's a mine. 
and then doing something based on whether it's a mine or not. So it looks like what I'm trying to grab is data, right? I'm trying to grab what the contents of that cell are, but is it really data? Uh, so in this case, you can see what the idea of grabbing data directly is. Sally is an object, and Bob is an object who has a property on him known as his age, 24. If Sally was directly grabbing the property of Bob's age and getting it back, she would be reaching into his object and grabbing back the value of 24. Now, um, in Ruby, this is not actually how things work. Um, whenever you get something from some other object, you're not actually grabbing its data. Instead, you're sending a message to it. What does that actually mean? Uh, in this case, Sally is actually asking Bob what his age is, and Bob has an opportunity through the method that he implements that responds to the message of age to determine what he re responds with. So in this case, if Bob is trying to impress someone, he returns his age plus five years. Otherwise, he actually returns his age. So now what happens if Sally asks the same message or sends the same message to another object? In this case, the Harry object. So Harry implements a method, a, an age method, so he responds to the same age message, but he does it in a very different way. He's always honest and always returns his actual age. So there's a difference between messages and methods. Um, a message is what you send to an object. A method is how you respond to that object. How can we use that in this code? Well, um, when we're doing things like grabbing the contents of the cell, or we're setting the contents of that cell, we're not actually grabbing that piece of data. We are using this method, the methods that are defined when we call adder accessor of contents to, to create both a query command or a query method and a command method. A query method just means something that returns a result. So in this case, it returns the contents. And a command is something that does something. In this case, setting the contents equal to the flag. Now, can I hide those two things in something a little bit more confident so that the people who are using this cell don't actually have to know how I've implemented my flag and my mine. I can. So you can see here in my choose method down at the bottom, instead I'm asking the cell whether or not it has a mine. And right above it, I'm telling a cell to flag itself. And the way that I've actually implemented that is by setting the content, which is my underlying data structure that I use to determine whether or not these things are mines or flags, to my mine symbol or to my flag symbol. So a senior recognizes that there is no such thing as data in Ruby. There's only messages um, and message passing, message sending. So in order to be confident um, in the way that we interact with other methods, we ask nicely instead of grabbing other people's internals. And we tell confidently instead of doing it ourselves in the instance of trying to set um, the contents of that cell to a flag. The last is thinking like a baby. So whereas a senior asks, who are you? A baby asks, who am I? What does this mean? Well, what's so special about me? What is so special about my own object? What's so special um, about the class that I'm actually working on? Everything in Ruby, like I said, is actually message sending, including messages sent to self. So in this case, uh, back to our date range example, I'm actually writing an overlapped method. So an, the overlapped method uh, looks to see whether or not two date ranges overlap one another. And you can see my three different use cases for when they're true. One of which is when one of them completely overlaps the other, another when the um, end date or the start date is between the other one, and another one where the end date is between the other one. And you can see how I've implemented this. Um, I return true if my at start date method, so my fundamental property, my at start date, is between the other two. And I have, uh, and I'm referencing that uh, instance variable, my at start date, in three different places within my, uh, within my object. Now, is this good? The answer is probably no. What were to happen if I just heard on the news that 
um, the National Institute of Standards has to implement a correction for dates. You know, um, the atomic clock just changed, and now everyone has to move two seconds into the future. Um, if instead I was using messages or sending messages to myself, so in this case I'm calling the start date method on myself, um, and I've replaced all of my, my instances of grabbing my instance method with sending that method, I can now hide the information of what it means to calculate the start date, and I can hide my uh, correction factor from the National Institute of Standards into something like that. So the summary that we can get from that is uh, other methods within yourself should actually be treated like other objects. You should hide your own data because it helps you to hide information um, and give yourself entry points into changing the way that certain things are calculated. So giving a little bit of summary from everything that we've learned today, uh, as a teenager, make your constructors matter. Um, the idea of identity in software is super important, and you'll find more and more that if you can use value types instead of entity types, so things that only depend on whether or not they have the same attributes and respond to the same messages in the same way, uh, your life will be a lot easier. Uh, as a child, think about function signatures. So make sure that every method that you write um, takes a consistent set of inputs and always returns back a consistent set of outputs. Try and minimize the amount of returning nil as you can, because that's an entry point um, that another method then has to do nil checking on. As an adult, uh, use errors to prevent yourself from getting into an unknown state. So don't allow other people to send you things that you don't want. Don't allow other people to send you strings when instead you want an instance. As a senior, make sure that you send messages to other objects and you're always thinking of the fact that you're sending messages instead of directly grabbing data. And as a baby, remember that yourself is no different. Um, you are another object when you're talking about your own methods. So um, there's a lot of information in here, and there's a lot more information that you can learn. Um, and this talk contains a lot of really good things that I've extracted from these two books that you should read if you're really interested in it. Um, Practical Object Oriented Design in Ruby by Sandy Metz. She has a lot of different books, and they're all wonderful. She has a lot of good talks, too. Confident Ruby by Abby Grimm, and Refactoring by Martin Fowler. Any questions? Thank you so much. Um, everyone, f feel free that you you can use the question and answer app in in the Hangout. It's on the left side. It's that little blue Q and A thing. Um, you can ask questions in Slack if you want, and I'll pass them on. Or uh, obviously, you can you can just jump right into the Hangout here and uh, feel free to ask live. Yeah, and uh, Chris, thank you so much um, for for this for this talk um, to the to the current students. The timing of Chris's talk relative to our own curriculum is not an accident. Um, Chris, Chris is a friend of mine, and he was very helpful to me when I was working through the Minesweeper project uh, in the last cohort. So um, I knew that he would have some a lot of good material for you as you are fresh off, uh, you know, learning to do those games and object orientation. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to dominate. I'll have some questions if other people don't, but I'd love to have some current students. All right, well, maybe if you have one or two of your own, we can, we can get things going. Cool. Yeah, Chris, could you elaborate a little bit more on um, sort of, uh, using custom initializers? That was sort of a, a breakthrough moment for me the first time you and I talked about that, where you don't have to create a new object using class name dot new. Mm -hmm. um, if you could maybe maybe flip back to a point in the presentation where you talked about that and, and just kind of really detail what you're doing there. Sure. We'll do. Might just be a little while to get all the way back there, but uh, it was way back, I think. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Oops. Oh, keep clicking. Okay. Sure. So this slide in particular. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, you definitely don't have to use class name dot new. You know, um, one of the things that we often do is we learn sort of the, the most basic pattern and then sort of attempt to apply it. But uh, you don't have to be locked into that. Um, in this case, uh, you can see that I've decided. So I've, I've looked at what it means to be a date range. In this case, uh, you can see a start rate, date, an end date, and a duration. And I've come up with what, in my system, I'm going to use to model a date range. And I've made the direct decision that I'm going to model a date range using only a start date and a duration. Right. So I've actually made my regular initializer only take a start date and a duration. And I've left that third property, that end date, which can be calculated um, to a method that you can call on a date range instance, uh, where it will actually dynamically calculate what the end date is by adding the duration to the start date. Um, but that may, might not be the only way that I want to use or create this object within my system, right? Like sometimes I just have a start date and an end date, and I want to give those to you without having to do it somewhere else in the code. So you can actually you can listen to that request and still fulfill it by creating another entry point into creating an object in your system, which is this custom initializer. So in this case, I've created a new class method, so um, different from an instance method, a class method, that I can actually use date range dot new with end date and pass it a start date and an end date. And within that, it will dynamically calculate this duration, which it happens to be you know, the functional inverse or whatever of this calculation right here to calculate that duration and then use the new method, which is what we normally use, so date range dot new, to then pass in the start date that I got and the new duration that I calculated. So it may seem backwards, right? In this case, it may seem like, well, I've already got an end date. Like, why am I going to turn that into a duration, give that to you, and then have you recalculate the end date? Well, the reason is so that you don't have this mess that you had before of uh, wondering whether or not someone is going to send you an end date or send you a duration. You have a very strict contrast of what your constructor or your initializer looks like that everyone else knows this is how I have to interact with this system. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. I think um, that was a, a really clear explanation of, of what's going on there. Wonderful. Anyone else have a question? Well, Michael, it looks like you're talking, but we can't hear you. How about now? Yes. Great. Um, I actually had a follow-up on that, if you didn't mind. Sure. Um, which is that um, th th this seems to sort of um, sort of bring up the question of kind of where this line uh, between kind of this pattern, you know, where where you sort of draw the line between doing an approach like this with sort of a clear one initializer versus something like an options hash pattern, um, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. sort of sort of sort of how essential does something have to be for it to be you know absolutely it should be in your initializer you should have to take this parameter not another and um, a custom initializer handles you know alternate cases. Um, well, I, I see where you're coming from, that it can seem almost dogmatic, but I am actually not afraid of dogma. And I would say try and not use this idea of an option pass as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. If you can, use these custom initializers. Because what happens is if you cannot tell just by looking at a method signature what something requires in order to be created correctly, um, you're not going to use it correctly. Uh, so if something has an options hash, or it looks like it's an options hash, but really it, it requires you know, um, a certain flag in it that you didn't know that you had to pass, um, it's going to screw up the rest of the system. You know? um, and there are other patterns, so design patterns, which I don't know if you guys have spoken about yet, but um, this idea of a design pattern really just means um, a way that software engineers have um, made software to solve a certain problem in a certain way. Um, that can be ported across languages. There are certain design patterns that you can use to provide that same idea of options um, without actually screwing with what it means to initialize that function. Um, and I can give you a little bit more resources on which, which 
design patterns in particular um, could be used. But um, if you want to write down the builder pattern as an example, um, mm -hmm. of something that can allow you to uh, customize an object without necessarily uh, taking away from what your constructor is. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I was, uh, all right, well, I, I had a question about um, when you were when you were talking about, I think it was the baby phase, when, when, you, were, when you were questioning yourself. And, and uh, how, how does that relate to privacy? And, and you know, because I noticed you, you didn't have any private methods there, and I don't know if that was uh, intentional or, or, or just for presentation. But, um, uh, we, you know, we, we've also been talking to these folks about, about you know, try, trying to keep your interface as narrow as possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that was something I kind of didn't want to get into, just in case you guys hadn't really spoken about that. But um, I completely, completely agree with the fact that you should keep your interface as narrow and as small as possible. Um, in the case of this date range, which was the, uh, um, the way that I talked about the baby, sort of all of these properties, the start date, the duration, the end date, and this overlaps method, are sort of appropriate to be public. Uh, it makes sense for something to question these things. It's not sort of an implementation detail. Um, there are other examples where um, I did not put in private, but I wanted to, but I didn't in, 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 so that I could make this talk. But uh, let me try and find Yeah, I think it was when you were talking about messages. Yeah. So you're, you're using the method. You're using the the message to call the method instead of accessing the property directly, and, and that was what kind of triggered me on that. Yeah, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, Which I thought was yeah, because seniors ask other people, babies ask themselves. Yeah. Oh yeah, this one. Yeah, in this case. Um, so okay, so one of the things that um, I wanted to do in this case, but I didn't do is I would actually make this adder accessor content private, completely and utterly private. No one outside of my cell class needs to know that the way that I model inside of my cell, whether or not something has a mine or a flag, is through this idea of a content property. No one has to know that. The only ways that something should be interacting um, with my system are through these two methods here, right? Or any other methods that I use or that I've created in order to query or command on my internal state. Um, so here's a wonderful example. And you can actually see that I've deleted the adder accessor because I've used um, my um, instance variables in order to uh, query these things and provide a very um, appropriate and consistent public interface. Yeah, and I, I think also the, the, the private class method new. Uh, do you mind describing kind of what, what you're doing there as it regards to, as it relates to privacy? Sure, yeah. So um, we That's were something talking, we haven't seen yet. Sure. Uh, we were talking earlier about, like, you know, cell.new or date range.new, and that's normally how you initialize um, an object. In this case, um, my cell is different, right? Uh, I don't want people to just be able to do cell.new because they don't know what it means internally to create a cell of a certain type, right? I've got these two different ideas. I've got a mine cell. I've got a flag cell. Um, but the outside world doesn't need to know how I've constructed those. So I don't want to give people the opportunity to just call cell.new. So what I can do is turn that method, that new method, which I don't normally own, it's on object. Um, I can actually turn it private so that no one can call it on me. I still have available to me this initializer. And within my function, um, I can still use new. But the outside world can, cannot use my new. Um, so I've I've even further uh, taken down what is available for other people to use on the cell so that they have to use one of my two custom initializers to create a cell of a certain type. Thank you. Yeah, well, okay. One very tiny follow-up on that. Um, that's just what I'm seeing right in front of me. Um, is regarding privacy and um, and how you were talking about how essentially don't use instance variables, use you know uh, mm -hmm. interfaces to those instance variables. I'm seeing 
contents equals equals mine. So in that kind of a contest, is that overkill or? Um, in my opinion, no. Um, I didn't do it here because I hadn't introduced that concept yet. Or did I introduce that concept? No, that was in the next one. Okay. Um, so that was in my very last one, baby, where where I actually wrapped this at contents into a method. Um, but if I were rewriting this in myself, I would still make a private adder reader or adder accessor in this case for at contents. And I sort of always default to doing that because um, it's easier to change a method implementation than it is to go in and refactor all of these to use my method. Does that make sense? Um, I would have to go in and take out the at symbol from every single place that I used it, whereas if I had already just created that adder accessor, I could just redefine what it means to get or set that property. Great. Well, can I ask a question? Um, sure. Can you hear me? Uh, what's the yeah. difference between doing where you do here, where you do sell that new mine to make a new mine, or sell that new flag to make a new flag, and having like a subclass that initializes with contents being a mine or flag instead? You know, yeah. Like if you want a mine that inherited from sell. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so this, there's a larger, larger debate about the idea of actual subtyping um, or creating uh, subclasses that I don't necessarily want to get into. But a lot of people have very good reasons to not like subclassing and using object hierarchies. But in this case, um, the reason why I don't do it is because um, a cell, a mine cell is actually not different from a flag cell, right? These are two different states which can be transitioned to one another. So even if I originally have a mine on my cell, I can still flag that cell, you know? And it transitions from being a mine cell to a flag cell, uh, at least according to the way that I've constructed the world. Um, it's a lot harder to change the subtype of a class than it is to change the things that I have inside of me, if that makes sense. It's a lot easier to change what at contents contains inside of it than to initialize a new, you know, um, flag cell. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So if you're transitioning between states and it makes sense for you to actually be able to transition between states, using subclasses and object hierarchies is actually an inappropriate way to solve that problem. Are there any other questions? Last call. All right. All right. Well, Chris, th thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you, Dan, for, for bringing Chris to us. And, and I mean, I, this is phenomenal, and it'll, it'll be available online. Um, you know, we, we have this as a Hangout on Air, so it'll be on YouTube. Um, Chris, is there, is there any good, good well, what's the best way to contact you if, if, if the students want to thank you? Sure. Um, I have up my self-promotion slide. Um, yeah. You can look at my website, materialdesigner.com, which actually right now just points to my Medium blog, which doesn't have enough on it. But um, <laughs> you can also follow me on Twitter, at Material Designer. You can see it at the bottom of every single one of these slides. Um, GitHub.com slash C. Hendricks. And there's my LinkedIn profile as well. Um, I'm super free to answer sort of any questions that people still have about these or to engage in a larger talk about intermediate and advanced object orientation. Uh, so feel free to reach out. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Um, one of our students, Olga, asked in a private channel if the presentation would be available. Yes. Uh, I will give you a keynote, and I will also convert it into a PDF. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Well, re really appreciate it, especially uh, in, in, in the evening here. Um, so thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for coming out, and uh, I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.